So it's a rainy and bleary day here in the trailer recording studio. And yeah, I'm calling it a trailer. Other people might call it a box in a parking lot. But anyway, what better conditions here in the rain and, you know, the bleariness here than to talk about the Russian Revolution. Okay, so this thing is a very important event in world history. It goes down in 1917. And like many things, it has a number of causes. So one of the big causes was what we'll call class struggles. Okay, so uh, in particular, the lower class, the peasants, um, these people had a history of being oppressed in Russia as far as uh, not having a ton of rights, not seeing, you know, sort of the fruits of their labor, and they're having to deal with a lot of issues. Um, you know, I mean, serfdom was abolished in Russia in 1861, okay, like serfs, you know, that's the same type of serfs we talk about, you know, in the Middle Ages and like the you know, the 800s and the 900s, uh, you know, that those were the days of like knights and serfs and lords. Okay, that stuff doesn't get abolished in Russia till uh, 1861. So a lot of people think, you know, uh, perhaps some of these social conditions in Russia were a little bit backwards. Okay, they're dealing with industrialization and, you know, some of the issues that we've talked about as far as, you know, the working class um, and how they're being represented as far as whether or not that's happening uh, in the government and things like this. So uh, there's kind of this underlying uh, class tension that is going on in Russia. Um, now, there's also a couple of big, uh, what I'll call, you know, kind of flashpoint or breaking point events. Okay, so one of these events is uh, what's known as the Russo-Japanese War. All right, so, uh, you know, if you looked at a map of Russia, uh, which I should probably uh, provide here, Ah, so look at that. I asked for a map, and then it magically appears. The wonders of the Internet. So anyway, if you look at a map of Russia, okay, here it is. And, you know, Russia is unique for a lot of reasons, but one of them is that it's it's in many ways a European country, of course. Okay, look at the, you know, close borders with Eastern Europe, and it's relatively close to uh, Western Europe over here. And it's uh, also got kind of ties into the Middle East here. Uh, pathway there, and it also, in many ways, is an Asian country, okay, so there's connections with uh, China and Japan, borders over there, uh, so, you know, what ends up happening with this Russo-Japanese war is there's a dispute with Imperial Japan uh, over some of this territory up here, uh, and they fight a war over it, okay, and you have to remember that during this period in history, uh, Europeans and, you know, European powers like Britain and France were absolutely, uh, you know, dominating the rest of the world, okay? Africa had been carved up, the scramble for Africa, uh, India, China, so uh, there was this view that European powers were superior, okay? So what ends up happening is uh, the Japanese absolutely crush uh the Russians in a series of battles, uh, you know, the war may have been closer than that, but Japan, most people think, wins this war, which is very surprising. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually um, brokers the peace between the two countries, but uh, this is very humiliating and it's, um, you know, embarrassing, okay, so that the humiliation aspect of it uh, is something that might be important, and uh, this is a stain on kind of Russia's image in the world, okay, so that's a big factor here, uh, leading to unrest. Uh, another here is what's known as Bloody Sunday. Uh, so what happens in 1905 uh, is some protesters kind of uh, approach, uh, you know, the capital, and they're trying to petition the czar, who's the leader of Russia, you know, trying to get some of these reforms put in. Uh, and these protesters get slaughtered, okay, on orders, uh, you know, presumably from uh, higher up the food chain. Um, and it's 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 pretty bad. Dozens, uh, maybe more people are killed. And, you know, this leads to outrage. Okay, so there's plenty of outrage to go around. Uh, and it does lead to some reforms as a result, uh, including what's known as a Duma, which is kind of like parliament 
uh, for Russia there. So uh, you might need to know what a Duma is. Um, I'm not sure. All right. Uh, one other thing that we need to mention here as far as causes of the Russian Revolution, Tsar Nicholas II was not a fantastic leader as far as being effective. Um, so he was slow to make some of these reforms that the peasants and the lower classes were asking for. Um, and he also, you know, got Russia involved in World War I, which of course is a disaster. He wasn't able to maneuver those waters effectively. And then when the whole situation began to crumble in 1917, he didn't make the appropriate power moves, the autocratic moves that, you know, someone like a, uh, you know, a more talented leader, you know, a more Machiavellian leader might have made. All right. The other thing to note about Tsar Nicholas II was he was he was definitely uh, a family man. So you can read his letters with other leaders and his letters to his wife and stuff. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these leaders at this time, they get married and, you know, it's like arranged political marriages where, uh, you know, it's 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 not really a love situation, but uh, it does appear Nicholas did, you know, love his family, love his wife, uh, and love his children, uh, which is going to become important later in the story, so keep that in mind. But the main cause of the Russian Revolution was Russia's involvement in World War One, which we've talked about. Total disaster. Millions of people are dead. Uh, the whole country is going, uh, you know, broke. They're spending money on this. They're going hungry. People are sending their food to the soldiers at the front, and they're starving uh, at home. And it's just an absolute disaster in the war. Uh, the Russian leaders, for the most part, are uh, either inept, incompetent, or, you know, too willing to sacrifice lives. Um, you know, there's a couple commanders uh, that do okay, but uh, it was chaos in Russia. It was total chaos, okay, by the time 1917 rolls around as a result of World War I. Now, um, one other thing uh, to mention here is a guy by the name of Grigory Rasputin. All right, so Rasputin, here he is, um, and you can just tell by looking at him, okay, there's some people in history where you just look at them and you know they're crazy, okay, so... Uh, Here's the deal. Uh, Tsar Nicholas and the Tsarina had what's known as a, son, a hemophiliac son. Okay, so the son had hemophilia, which uh, is a blood disease, all right? And it basically means that your blood doesn't clot, okay? So um, if you get like a bruise or a cut, okay, for normal people, that means, you know, eventually the blood dries up and you know, you might have a little scar, but then you move on with your life. But uh, if you have hemophilia, uh, that could continue to bleed and, you know, internal bleeding and stuff, that could be very dangerous and deadly. Okay, so this kid was very sick. Uh, he's very sickly. Uh, here he is here, um, you know, and uh, obviously he would spend a lot of days like just in bed and he was close to death a couple of times. And uh, it seems like somehow this guy who was kind of known as like a, you know, a mystic type of uh, mysterious sort of, uh, you know, healer, you know, we might call it, uh, you know, something along the lines of like herbal remedies or stuff like that. But uh, the problem was this guy was crazy, okay, but he was inside uh, the political atmosphere because he was close with the Tsar, he was close with the Tsarina because he was able to work his magic on this uh, kid, okay, so the other doctors weren't able to help him, but uh, for some reason Rasputin, like, basically brings this kid back to life, um, and, you know, that's great, but the problem is Rasputin, uh, Rasputin was crazy, okay, so he was out in the streets, uh, like, partying, like, you know, waking up uh, in the middle of, you know, St. Petersburg, uh, you know, in a ditch uh, at, you know, whatever, in the morning, and people are walking by, like, who is this crazy guy? Uh, and he was, you know, a peasant, so he was kind of hanging out, you know, with the upper class. So, you know, look at all these upper class folks uh, in Russia and this, you know, crazy peasant uh, mystic healer guy who's, you know, going out and partying every night, uh, you know, and people didn't like this. Okay, so a lot of people thought, oh, this Rasputin guy is, he's taking over uh, the czar and he's influencing what's going on in Russia. Now, whether or not that was true or not, um, you know, is up for debate. Okay, so what ends up happening is, you know, some of these aristocrats, these higher level guys, they make a plot to kill him. 
Uh, so they invite him over for dinner. They end up shooting him. Uh, uh, but before they do that, they actually poison him. So he was poisoned. The poison's not working. And they're figuring, you know, this guy's some sort of crazy monster. He doesn't die from the poison. Uh, so they shoot him. And, you know, that doesn't kill him. And he's trying to, like, run out of the house. And they shoot him a couple more times. And they uh, finally figure he's dead. They wrap him up in a rug. And they throw him in the river. Uh, and then supposedly, you know, when they find the body later, like he was still struggling. So, uh, you know, he, you know, was very hard to kill. You know, that story almost certainly not true, but uh, it is fun. Uh, yeah, there he is. Uh, so imagine that guy, um, you know, influencing your politics. Okay, that would be crazy. So you have World War One. you have a lot of these economic issues, you have people going hungry, you have chaos, and tensions are rising in the capital. So uh, protests began to happen. There's labor protests, there's women's marches in Petrograd, which uh, we would call St. Petersburg now. Many soldiers actually join into these protests. Other soldiers just desert their post, and that's it. The Tsar is forced to abdicate the throne, so he's done. And this is called the February Revolution because it happens in February of 1917. Uh, you might also see March, so it just depends which calendar you're using. Uh, so here are those protests again. And once the Tsar abdicates the throne, that means he's done. They put in a provisional government, a temporary government, to figure out uh, what's going to happen in Russia and who's going to take charge. So uh, the autocracy is over. And it's kind of this liberal democracy type of thing where it's kind of like a parliament with the Soviets who are known as the Bolsheviks. Okay, these are the, uh, this is basically the communist uh, party of Russia. Okay, so we do need to know that. Uh, so the Bolsheviks uh, have a, a good amount of power. A lot of this working class sentiment is uh, fueling communism, you know, the communist party in Russia. And you have kind of more mild variety of socialists. You have liberals, uh, and they're all fighting to compete for power. Okay, so this government's led by a guy named Alexander Kerensky, and he's kind of in charge of this more liberal group, more Western. You know, he would have support from, like, Western governments, you know, as compared to the Bolsheviks or the socialists. And he keeps Russia in World War I, which is a big mistake, okay? He didn't take the temperature of the room appropriately, and that's not good, okay, because all of that death and all of that destruction was not something that most people in Russia wanted to continue to take part in, okay, and it leads to more and more chaos, and it actually bolsters the Bolsheviks who are uh, basically advocating to leave the war, okay, so uh, within a few months we get the October Revolution, and this is where the Bolsheviks, again, the communists, seize control of many important government buildings, and they take control of the government. Uh, the guys we need to know in charge, uh, Vladimir Lenin, okay, so here he is, uh, and Leon Trotsky are the leaders of this party. And, you know, boom, all of a sudden, a communist group is in charge of one of the most powerful countries in the world. So everybody's freaking out now, okay? So the United States, Britain, France, everybody's freaking out trying to figure out what's going to happen. Um, you know, the, only, the, only, the one country that's not freaking out is probably Germany because they're happy that Russia is now going to leave the war and now maybe they have a chance to win the war, All right? But everyone else is freaking out. It's difficult to say, you know, how crazy this would have been back in 1917, all right? So Russia pulls out of the war. They're done with World War I. Uh, they make a deal with Germany known as the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Tsar Nicholas and his family end up getting executed. Uh, so, you know, popular Disney movie over here, uh, you know, that kind of plays off this whole, uh, you know, situation. Okay, a lot of, I guess, magic and green fairies there. But, uh, yeah, so what ends up happening okay, after the October Revolution is we get the Russian Civil War. Okay, so... Uh, the other people aren't going to take this lying down. The liberals aren't going to take this lying down. They don't want to have a communist government. Uh, Western powers, foreign powers like the United States and Britain, they don't want to see this happen. So uh, it's going to be a battle to the death with the Red Army 
uh, who are mainly controlled by the Bolsheviks, and the White Army, which is essentially everyone else that doesn't want to see a communist power in charge, uh, including aid from the United States and Britain and some other Western countries, and you have a six-year bloodbath in Russia. Brutal purges, violent atrocities, horrible casualties on both sides. Millions of people would die, uh, and ultimately you're going to get uh, the Bolsheviks winning and the beginnings of what becomes known as the Soviet Union, a communist government in Russia. So look at the casualties from this Russian Civil War, uh, millions of, you know, kind of battle casualties, but uh, including the civilian deaths and you had purges and, you know, terror uh, going on all over the place. And, you know, here's a quote I found from Wikipedia, so, you know, it's, it's accurate here, but uh, again from uh, historian Evan Maudsley, he said that the Russian Civil War uh, was described by some as the greatest national catastrophe that Europe had yet seen. Uh, think about that for a second. You know, Europe's been through some crazy stuff, so that's a bold statement. All right, so here's a little cartoon in case of emergency break glass. So Russia was in an emergency in World War I. Uh, there was chaos. There was economic confusion. There was people starving. And in their chaos, many people turned uh, to the Communist Party, uh, maybe something that they didn't fully understand. Uh, and, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. And, you know, the results would be uh, pretty horrifying. So Vladimir Lenin gets in charge. Uh, and from 1921 to 1928, he implements something called the New Economic Policy. Okay, so... Uh, what the new economic policy is, is a response to uh, some of the stricter communism that was happening. Okay, so the, the Russian, uh, you know, Bolshevik party takes over in 1917. Uh, and what's going to end up happening is they implement like a strong version of communism. Okay, so they start redistributing, you know, they start putting up quotas, they start uh, ordering people to, you know, send in food so they can distribute it to the appropriate places, uh, all the things that a, you know, strict communist government would do, uh, but at least the problems, okay, and people aren't really uh, doing so well. So what Vladimir Lenin does is he creates this new economic policy uh, where the state is still controlling the large industries, they're still controlling the banks, they're still controlling the economic decision-making, uh, there's still some land and wealth di uh, distribution, uh, but... Lenin does allow for some economic competition, some buying and selling, some capitalist principles, okay, and this is the new economic policy. So uh, a lot of people would be upset that this wasn't, you know, the true communist vision, uh, but Lenin was saying, look, we have to do something to make things better, and things do get better for a little bit thanks to the new economic policy. So there's Mr. Lenin there, uh, but... What ends up happening is Lenin dies, okay? So he's done, and one thing he recommends on his deathbed, you know, he's sitting there on his deathbed, and he's saying, don't let this Joseph Stalin guy get control of the Soviet Union, okay? Because he's brutal, I don't trust him, and he's going to be bad news. But unfortunately, Stalin takes over, he gets control, he increases uh, the police state, he increases prison camps, and he moves Russia back towards a strong version of communism with quotas and five-year plans and, uh, you know, tremendous amounts of, re you know, land and wealth redistribution and uh, basically a police state as far as uh, suppressing any dissent and millions of lives later and wars later. Uh, the rest is history. So... Uh, you know, that's a story for another day.